So how many of you guys have ever seen the show Hee Haw? <laughs> it's a weird question to ask people in New Jersey because this is not probably a show that was all that popular in the Northeast. Um, show me your hands again. You've seen or heard of Hee Haw? Okay, great. So when I was about six or seven years old, my grandparents introduced me. I grew up in Virginia. And um, my grandparents introduced me to this show. For those who aren't familiar with it, uh, it was largely a variety show, I guess you would call it. And it was centered around rural culture. It had a lot of country music, for those who like country music. And they did a lot of sketches, like variety sketches. And I mentioned that to say to you that as I was preparing for this week, there was a sketch that came back to me. You know how sometimes you will not have seen or heard of something and then you're, you're thinking about something or you're working on something and then somewhere out of your mind comes this thought? Well, the inspiration for the title of my talk today, Gloom, Despair, and Agony on Me, comes from Hee Haw. And it comes from the following sketch. So as we're getting started, if you're not familiar with Hee Haw, here's just a little taste. <laughs> How I connect this to Jeremiah and in over my head, we'll see in a minute. But here we go. Emily. <laughs> For those who are under 30, that probably feels very incredibly cheesy and corny. And maybe if you're over 30 as well, but I remember as a little boy sitting with my grandparents, so it sort of has a special connection to me. But when I was thinking about this week and I was thinking about where Jeremiah finds himself, that phrase stuck with me. And the idea as we're following Jeremiah, if you've not been with us, we're in a series, this is week number three, with a series called In Over My Head. And the series really is about finding yourself in a place where you are so up to your neck in trouble that you don't know what to do. And when you hit that space, everything within you wants to just quit, to give up, to give out. And so when we find Jeremiah, um, let me just backtrack for a second so that it'll make sense for today. Jeremiah, when he was about 18 years old, received a special calling from God. The problem was, it wasn't a calling that he wanted. God had a job for Jeremiah, but he felt totally ill-equipped. He did not want to do what God wanted him to do, because the job was super hard. He was to stand between God and an unrepentant Israel, and to try to call them back. Because you see, for years and years, decades upon decades, these people had been worshiping and following other false gods. They had been giving themselves over to practices such as the sacrifice of their own children to these gods. It was a dark time in the life of Israel. And Jeremiah, as an 18-year-old, was to step into this dark space and to speak words that they didn't want to hear. 
He was a prophet of gloom and doom. He had to show them. He had to tell them. He had to make them understand that the direction that they were heading was leading to judgment and to death. It's not a job that anyone would want, much less a teenager. So when we find Jeremiah today, he has been at his job for several years. And as he's at this job, he's not only at a low point, he's at a breaking point. You might imagine that as he comes to share some of the messages that he has, as the people don't want to hear him, they not only turn their ears out, off, they begin to, to set traps for him and do harm to him. He's really afraid. He's at, a really, he's at a place in his life where he's about to give up. And I don't know about some of you guys, but I know that I've hit many, many breaking points in my life. Not just where I'm feeling low, but where I feel like I just can't do it anymore. You familiar with breaking points? Breaking points are when you're barely covering the cost of your bills. You're barely making the ends meet. And then the transmission in your car goes out. That's a breaking point. Breaking points are when you are going back and forth to the hospital caring for an aging parent, bringing them home one day, only the next to call 911 because you find them unresponsive and unable and incoherent. Breaking points come when you have hit a long season of trying really hard to work your way out of a space and then something big, something cataclysmic falls on top of the hard can happen with our emotional health, our mental health, our physical health, our relational health, our financial health. It happens in a number of ways, but breaking points when they occur take us to this place where hopefully this morning we're going to learn something from Jeremiah. Because if you've not yet hit a breaking point, A, I'm surprised, but B, it's on its way. It's just the nature of life. I hate to be Jeremiah to you this morning, but the truth of the matter is, life is hard. And as we navigate the spaces that are difficult, it's important to gain insight from a guy who understands exactly what it means to hit these spots. Now, when Jeremiah, just to kind of set the scene for what we're going to read today, in chapter 19 of the book of Jeremiah, God tells Jeremiah that he wants him to go to the potter's field and to get a clay jar. Last week, he wanted him to go and get a belt. This week, he wants him to get a jar. There's a lot of visuals that God gives Jeremiah because I think we learn best with visual illustration. So he tells him to go and get a clay pot or a jar. And when he does, he wants him to go and gather a few of the leaders and take them on a field trip. And he wants to take them outside the city gates of Jerusalem to a place called the Valley of Ben-Hinnom. The Valley of Ben-Hinnom is where we get the word Gehenna, Hades. So when we think about this space, this is not like a flowery valley. This is a valley of death. In fact, if you were to leave out of Jerusalem, you would go through one of the gates, in particular the Dung Gate. Now when you think about dung, right, you think about what, why would they name the gate, one of the gates to the city, the dung gate. The reason they would name the gate the dung gate is because it's where they would take out all of their refuse, right? They would take out all of their crap and they would take it to this valley and they would dispose of it there. So you could imagine the stench in a place like this, just outside the city walls. And as they go to deliver that, it was also a place where they would burn their garbage. So the sulfur and the smells and the stench of all of the refuge of the city, you would imagine it would not be a place that you would want to go and visit. But not only was it that kind of place, it was a place where they set up altars so that they could make sacrifices to the various gods that Jeremiah was trying to call them back from. And in particular, there was a god there that they would burn their children to by the name of Molech. So their, their turning away from God had become so desperate 
that as a part of their sacrifices, they would take their children and they would burn them as an offering to this God. Hell on earth is where he's going to take them on a field trip. And as he takes them there, he takes this clay pot, this clay jar, he takes it and he throws it down right in front of them. And he says to them, you see these pieces on the ground? Yeah, we see these pieces on the ground. He said, that, that's going to be you very soon. You understand why Jeremiah doesn't want the job? He said, this broken, scattered clay pot, he said, these represent what's going to happen to you as a people as a result, and he turns to his left and he turns to his right as a result of your actions over the last decades as you have completely moved away from the lover of your heart and given yourself to someone that you've now reduced yourself to burning your children to. This is how bad it's gotten, and this is a wake-up call for you. It's time for you to make some changes. If you make no changes, these pieces are you. And then, in chapter 19, he goes back inside. He, he comes back from the Valley of ben He comes back up into the city. And he goes into the temple courts. And he moves from the leaders to basically those who lived in the community. This would have been family members, friends, people that he knew. And he goes to them and he shares with them basically the exact same message without the visual aid. How do you think they're going to receive this message? How do you receive a message from someone when they tell you something you don't want to hear? They not only are going to not listen to him, they're going to punish him. In fact, the leading priest of the day, when he heard it, felt like it would be bad for morale for Jeremiah to continue to go around and tell everybody, listen, you're going to be a broken pot in a matter of moments if you don't do something with what I'm sharing. So, Pashur, the chief priest of the day, whipped him, beat him publicly, put him in stocks, and left him out for everybody to see. He was basically put on display. It was public humiliation for Jeremiah for the day. And as people walked by, they taunted him, and they said nasty things to him. And this was all because he was being faithful to what God asked him to do. Gloom, despair, and agony on me. Deep, dark depression, excessive misery. If it won't for bad luck, he'd have no luck at all. Gloom, despair, and agony on Jeremiah. At 5 a.m., the chief priest who put him in the stocks comes back to get him in the secret of the night to release him. But Jeremiah can't let it go. Imagine yourself after having been beaten and put in stocks and publicly humiliated the guy comes to release you. I would think Jeremiah would just want to go off, find his bed, lay down, and never come back. But Jeremiah won't let it go. So when Pashur comes to let him go from the stocks, he like gives it to him, and this time he really goes Cujo on him. <laughs> he makes it personal, and he talks about what's going to happen not only to Israel and Judah, what's going to happen to him and his family. I mean, he is angry, and he lets him have it. And he lets him go anyway. Well, anyway, that sets the stage for what we're about to read in Jeremiah chapter 20. So if you want, you can follow along with me. If you don't have a Bible, you can just listen. So Jeremiah has just finished really a no good, horrible, very bad day. And as we reach chapter 20, we'll begin in verse 7 with a conversation that he's about to have with God. O oh Lord, you deceived me, and I allowed myself to be deceived. You are stronger than I am, and you overpowered me. And now I'm mocked every day. Everyone laughs at me, and when I speak, the words burst out. Violence and destruction I shout. And so these messages from the Lord 
They've made me a household joke. But if I say I'll never mention the Lord or speak in His name, His Word burns in my heart. It's like a fire. It's like a fire in my bones and I'm worn out trying to hold it in. I can't do it. I've heard the many rumors about me. They call me the man who lives in terror. They threaten. If you say anything, we'll report it. Even my old friends are watching me, waiting for a fatal slip. He'll trap himself, they say, and then we'll get our revenge on him. You understand what's going on in this dialogue or this monologue he's having with God? How's he feeling? He's not just angry. What else is he? What's that? He feels like God, when he called him to do this job, tricked him, deceived him. It's God's fault that this is happening. He's now turned all of the energies, the negative vibes that he has in his life, the anger, the disappointment, the frustration, his family's given up on him, his friends are laying in wait trying to set a trap. There's no safe place to go, and he turns to God, and he just lets God have it. Anybody in this space ever had a similar conversation with God? Some of us were taught growing up that we shouldn't have these conversations with God. Right? Were some of us taught that there were certain ways that we should talk to God and certain ways that we should interact with God and certain things that were just kind of off limits, whether or not we felt them or not? I, I submit to you that what Jeremiah is doing here feels lousy, but it's actually healthy. I actually think what he's doing here is something that is instructive for you and I. I think it's good. You say, well, what do you mean? How could something like that be good? Well, what is the opposite of what he's doing in this space? Just let's think about this for a second. Okay, Jeremiah has hit a breaking point. And he feels like God is responsible. And in many ways, God is responsible for him being here. This isn't a place he would have chosen. He didn't pick this. God called him and led him to this space and told him what to say and told him what to do. And here's the end result. Everybody has turned on him, even his family and friends. So whose fault is it? It's God's fault, right? And so when you hit this space, when there's no one else to blame, and you turn to God and you unload, I submit to you that this is healthy. Because the opposite of this is to begin to grow numb, to wall out, to spiral down, to turn in, and to shut down. And I would submit to you that many of us, when we hit a breaking point in our lives, do just that. And I think when we do these things that it does great damage to our soul. There's a professor um, at the University of Houston by the name of Brene Brown. Some of you are familiar with her. She's a sociologist. She's done a lot of research in the area of shame and pain. And uh, one of the things she says is that we cannot selectively numb emotions. When we numb the painful emotions, we also numb the positive emotions. So that's what we try to do when we experience a great deal of pain, many of us. We don't want to feel it, so we numb it. How do we numb it? Well, the popular fill in the blanks is drugs and alcohol, and for some of us that is true. But some of us do it with shopping. Some of us do it with the internet. Some of us do it with fantasy football. I mean, there's a variety of ways in which when we're feeling the way that we feel and we don't want to feel that way, to numb ourselves. And so the good news is when we numb our pain, we don't feel it is. But the bad news is we don't feel anything else either. We don't appreciate and value and experience love and empathy and compassion. We don't value and see and experience the beauty of a sunrise or a sunset or the changing of the seasons or the laughter of children or the flavor of ice cream. 
When we numb ourselves to our pain, we numb ourselves to everything else, is what Brene Brown says. Because you can't do one without the other. And I submit to you that even though it feels terrible, that what Jeremiah is doing is very instructive for you and I. This is going to be a stretch for some of you because you have never, ever earned this kind of explosive anger and disappointment and frustration towards God. You didn't think you could. But I'm, I'm going to say to you that Jeremiah joins a host of other people in the Scriptures, if you read the Scriptures carefully at all, who were not spiritually immature in doing so, but were very actually spiritually mature. Think about when Moses was out in the desert leading a group of people that God had called him to lead, and they wanted nothing to do with it. And he had to wander around for 40 years because they were unwilling, courageously, to take a few steps in a direction that would have led them to freedom and prosperity and the land of promise. There were many times where Moses hit breaking points, and he even despaired of life and basically said, just kill me now. Take my life. I'm so sick of this. And if you read Exodus and Deuteronomy, you will get the real, live, uncut version of Moses. Much like in the space that Jeremiah did. Elijah did the same thing. There are many people, as you look at the Scriptures, who were not spiritual lightweights, but spiritual heavyweights, who came to a place where they said to God whatever they had to say to God. And I think this is important for you to understand because you're going to feel the feelings anyway. So you might as well direct them to God rather than away from God, because if you numb the pain, you numb everything else. And then you wonder, well, where are you, God? Well, you've numbed yourself to the possibility of hearing from God because you were just so tired of the pain. And you turn to something that you thought would provide you some bit of respite, but at the end of the day, it took you away from a position of openness to the only one who could really help you in the place that you were most hurting. Jeremiah doesn't turn to drugs or alcohol or the internet or fantasy football or shopping or anything else. He opens up his pain in the presence of God and he speaks it as honestly as he can. And that's the first point that I want to share with you this morning that I think is significant for you and I. I think when we're in a place where we're at a breaking point in the deepest place of our need, I think the best thing we can do is be honest with God about it. And if that involves blaming God, then so be it. God can handle it. God's a big boy. In fact, very few others can handle the kind of stuff that sometimes builds up in us. But if you shut that stuff down and you numb yourself off to it, and then you wonder where God is, it should be no surprise that God's not in that because you've walled him out. You've blocked him off. You've decided that you didn't want to feel. And that's okay because it helps you from not feeling pain. That's the good news. But the bad news is you don't feel anything else either. So Jeremiah in this space encourages us to open up and move towards God and be honest with what we have. Listen to what David writes in Psalm 13. If you're not convinced with Moses and Elijah and Jeremiah, here's David. David says, O oh Lord, how long will you forget me? Forever? How long will you look the other way? How long must I struggle with anguish in my soul? Felt that? How long must I struggle with sorrow in my heart? Is it every day? How long will my enemy have the upper hand? There's a place for opening our hearts and being honest with God and staying in that space for as long as we need to stay until there is some place at which God meets us. Because, truth be told, the messes of our life are where God seems to most frequently show up and meet us and speak to us and provide for us what we need. We just have to give Him the opportunity to do that. God's not afraid to meet us in the mess. God desires to meet us in the mess. And the reason that I think God is so faithful to doing so is because so often in our lives we are so self-reliant that we don't have a need that we can recognize as being one that only God can meet. 
we go about our days and we do the things that we do and we're equipped to do them, but in some ways, it's the mess that reveals to us that we are totally, utterly helpless apart from God meeting us in this place. So if I could just say to you guys who are in hard spaces, low points, breaking points, and you've been numbing yourself not to feel the pain, just, just stop for a moment. Stop numbing yourself to the pain and everything else in your life and actually take a step of courage and feel it. Feel the pain and let it drive you, let it open you to the presence of God who I promise you will meet you in that space. It's what Jeremiah is teaching us. And then as he continues, I always used to, when I would read passages like this, I always used to just not know what to do with them. But, but think about what he's been leveling at God. You deceived me, and I let you deceive me, and I just can't do this anymore. And then he gets to this space in verse 11 where he says, it's like this about face. He says, but the Lord stands beside me like a great warrior. Before him my persecutors will stumble. They cannot defeat me. They will fail and be thoroughly humiliated. Their dishonor will never be forgotten. O Lord of heaven's armies, you test those who are righteous, and you examine the deepest thoughts and secrets. Let me see your vengeance against them, for I have committed my cause to you. Sing to the Lord, praise the Lord, for though I was poor and needy, he rescued me from my oppressors. And then in Psalm 13, which I just finished reading to you from David, where he asked, how long will you forget me? How long will you let me struggle in this space? Verse 5, but I trust in your unfailing love. I will rejoice because you have rescued me. I will sing to the Lord because he is good to me. When you're reading that and it takes you about 30 seconds to jump from this place of anguish and pain to this place of praise and celebration, it's hard for your mind to make sense of it, right? I mean, it feels schizophrenic on some level. So I didn't know what to do with this stuff. How, do you, how are you here and then you're here in like 10 seconds? How does that work? I think it works like this. I think when we're honest to God with whatever it is that we're going through, whatever it is that we are battling and dealing with and struggling with, when we're honest to God and we open ourselves in the presence of God, God has a habit of meeting us in that space. And as God meets us in that space, the circumstances may or may not change, but God's presence reveals to us something of his faithfulness and something of our ability to build a trust resume over time. You see, Jeremiah at this point had had the job for a few years. It wasn't his first day on the job. It wasn't his first rodeo. He had been beaten before. He had been tricked before. He had had things happen to him. And each of the times that they had happened to him, he wisely turned them towards God rather than away from. And what he found when he did was that God was faithful to protect and defend him, ultimately to complete the thing which he had given him to do. David found the same thing. Moses found the same thing. Elijah found the same thing. Every single person who cries their laments, understand this. Lament is not just a drive-by at God. It's not like, like a drive-by shooting where you just spout all of your misery and then you just go on about your life. It's where you spout these things to God, but then you sit in a space where you allow God to meet you in that and provide for you something that you didn't have before the exchange. Jeremiah, David, Moses, Elijah at some point, move from belief to trust, from belief to faith, something that was in their head to that was in their heart, and they had the courage to act on the things that they knew to be true, and it built a faith resume so that when they hit the next breaking point, they could read, they could speak, verse 11 and 12 and 13. But if you don't take these things to God, you can't build up this resume. You can only find that God is faithful when there's space in your life for God to be faithful. If you're self-reliant and you're resistant 
and you numb yourself to the pain in your life and there's no space for God, there's no faith resume. At some point, if we're going to call ourselves a people of faith, there has to be a point at which we express faith, even in the middle of our messes. So is it possible that in one hand we can hold the anger and the disappointment and the frustration and express that to God and on the same hand trust that God's going to bring us through? I don't think it's either or. I actually think it's both and. And then when God actually does bring us through, we have a song of praise to sing and to speak because we've seen God be faithful to us in the most wretched of all places. See, most of us, we just try to avoid these spaces. When we hit these spaces, we beg God to take us out of these spaces. But what if these spaces are the very spaces that God has brought us to to transform our lives? to shape our characters, to renew and revive our minds, our souls, our lives? What if, what if the worst, difficult, most dark place in our lives that we find ourselves is the very place that God intends to meet us and show us something that we need to see and deliver us into a new way of being so that when we move through that, our level of faith, the character that we possess, the life that we live is renewed and revived and resurrected. What if that's true? <laughs> Jeremiah says it is. David says it is. Elijah says it is. Moses says it is. I say it is. So there. <laughs> There's at some point where we just have to be honest with God. You say, oh no, I, I could never. You feel it anyway, don't you? Do you think it's some surprise to God how you feel? You might as well open up and invite him into it. And in that space where invitation occurs, transformation occurs. Invitation always leads to transformation. When you invite God and you give God the space to meet you, God will meet you and he will change you and he will lead you out of that space into a new way of living and being. We just got to stop numbing ourselves, guys. Nobody moves towards pain, but I'm telling you, if you open to it and you invite God into it, God will do incredible, amazing things, such that when you move from verse 10 to saying, you tricked me, to verse 11 saying, you are my defender, something has to happen between verse 10 and 11 for you to be able to speak that. But he speaks that, and he means that. And I think that's the instruction for you and I. Gloom, despair, and agony on me. If deep, dark depression, excessive misery, if it won't for bad luck, I'd have no luck at all. We sometimes feel that way, don't we? But what if we actually took that and rather than just feeling it, we spoke it and we invited God to meet us in that space. God gives us new songs when, the, when we have the courage to speak the old ones in his presence and invite him to do something with who we are and what we're doing. And I trust as we move through this journey with Jeremiah that we can learn from him. It's a 2,600 year old story, but I think it's relevant for you and me. I hope you heard what you needed to hear. Now. This week was the first week where we've kind of shifted things a little bit. Usually on the front end, we'll give you some time of quiet. You'll enter the sanctuary quiet. And some of you don't even know that we do this with our prelude because you don't really show up five minutes early or, or on time. But it's usually like a quiet space. And so what we've decided to do was, was flip it for the next few weeks and just see how it went. So now when you come in, you don't have to be, shh, you don't have to be quiet. You just come in as you are. There's an energy, there's a celebration to being here, but it's at the end where we just want to reflect quietly for a minute or two. And what I want you to think about is I want you to think about what you've heard and how you feel and where you are with God. And I want you, the worship team is going to come back up. We're going to have a closing song in just a moment. But I want you to have just a minute or two to just think. You know, normally we finish, I say goodbye, bless you, you leave. But I think maybe it would have some value just to sit quietly and think about what you've heard. About being given permission to be honest with God. About 
stopping numbing yourself in whatever form it takes. About moving from a place of not only speaking your anguish, but also expressing trust. Because trust is part of the lament too. So I'm going to ask um, the worship team to come. They're going to they're going to eventually lead us in a song, but we're going to just have instrumental, like just for like a minute or two. I just want you to think about what you've heard. And I want you to consider that as it applies to your life. Okay?